Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Solving From Anywhere, Cardinal and Gray Society Edition. My name is Nancy Mims, and I am Associate Director, Class Programs in the MIT Alumni Association. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing in the near future on the Cardinal and Gray Society website. You may submit questions today during the broadcast by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Whitney Espick, Chief Executive Officer of the MIT Alumni Association. Welcome. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, and uh, you are very welcome to this Zoom edition of Solving From Anywhere. Uh, this is for the Cardinal and Gray Society, and we're so pleased to have so many of you with us today. My name is Whitney Espick, and I'm the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association. We are just thrilled to have this opportunity to connect you, our Cardinal and Gray alumni and alumnae, with the efforts of MIT Solve. For those of you who might not know, Solve is a community of cross-sector leaders devoted to identifying solutions for pressing challenges through open innovation. It is an institute initiative whose mission aligns so well with the Alumni Association's own vision to engage and inspire the global MIT community to make a better world. Solve provides a platform for people around the globe, including each of you, to develop workable solutions to society's greatest challenges. Today, you will hear from, uh, you will hear about this better world making in action. First from Professor uh, Feng Zheng, a transformative biologist and a CRISPR pioneer, who is also a faculty champion of this SOLVE effort. Later, Professor Zheng will join a panel of SOLVE team leaders, including alumnus Dennis Yancey and alumna Heather Bean. The panel will be moderated by SOLVE's executive director, Alex Amuyel. Alex Amuyel is the Executive Director of SOLVE, and previously she was the Director of Program for the Clinton Global Initiative. She also worked for Save the Children International in London and across Asia, the Middle East, and Haiti, also at the Boston Consulting Group. After Alex moderates that discussion, we will conclude the panel portion of our event, and those of you who registered to participate in our smaller group discussions will be invited to join one of four chats based on your expressed interest in certain topics. Those topics are, as a reminder, social justice and technology, health security and pandemics, natural climate solutions, and lifelong learning. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce MIT professor Feng Zheng to share an overview of his work and then take us into the panel portion of the gathering. Professor Zheng is a molecular biologist focused on improving human health. He played an integral role in the development of two revolutionary technologies that you may have read about, optogenetics and CRISPR-Cas systems, including pioneering the use of Cas9 for genome editing and discovering CRISPR-12 and CRISPR-Cas12 CRISPR and, CRISP and Cas13 systems and developing them for the therapeutic and diagnostic applications. Professor Zhang is a core member of the Broad Institute, an investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research, the James and Patricia Poitras Professor of Neuroscience at MIT, and he is a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. We are delighted to have him here to lead up our conversation today. Welcome, Professor Zhang. I pass it to you. Thank you very much, Whitney. Um, <laughs> hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, present to you some of our work on uh, developing uh, new technologies for uh, studying um, uh, human biology, um, life sciences, and also uh, for developing the tools for, for diagnostics applications. So um, I prepared a few slides to uh, give us an um, overview of the work that we've been doing. And, um, and so I, I will start uh, here. So I, I'm a <coughs> professor in the Montgomery Institute uh, at MIT and in the Department of uh, Brain, Brain Economy Sciences. And one of the things that we have been focused on is to develop new technologies to help understand uh, how uh, the brain and also how overall uh, biology works. And then to use some of these tools to be able to develop new uh, treatments and also diagnostic solutions to improve human health. The way we go about developing uh, technologies is by, by drawing from inspirations in nature. So when you look at this picture here, there are all sorts of uh, life uh, around here. There are the trees, 
uh, there are different kinds of uh, <coughs> smaller plants, and then there are also uh, many um, organisms that live in the water here, uh, microorganisms as well as uh, fish and, and other animal species. Each one of these species have evolved uh, very powerful mechanisms to allow them to survive in the, in the natural wild. And the things that we get inspired from them are the molecular machineries that they have evolved over billions of years to allow them to survive in the natural diversity. And then we can harness some of them so that we can use it uh, to improve uh, human health. So I have um, two short uh, vignettes uh, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first one is on uh, harnessing a immune system from bacteria and using that immune system to the edit genomes. And this has implications for both uh, studying uh, disease, but also for treating disease and, and even beyond uh, in agriculture. So the background for this is that um, a really exciting events um, happened in the life sciences a little more than a, a little more than 10 years ago. And that is um, scientists now have the ability to sequence the full genomes of organisms. The genome is the genetic blueprint. And so here are pictures of uh, what the human genome looks like. These are the different chromosomes uh, that are in uh, the human uh, cells. And um, now scientists are able to read every single letter of these uh, uh, genomes. As scientists begin to, to read uh, genetic information uh, from many different individuals, uh, they are able to start to identify uh, genetic differences that may underlie disease. So on this slide are three different diseases, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, eye degeneration, uh, just some of the examples where scientists now know what are the genetic differences uh, that can cause these uh, really devastating diseases. And so as scientists discover uh, these differences, um, one of the tantalizing ideas is that why don't we uh, figure out a way so that we can go into the cells of people who are affected by these illnesses and replace uh, the erroneous sequence with something that, that, um, that people, that healthy individuals have, and this way we can uh, cure them of their um, illness. And so the way that you would do this um, uh, in, a, in a document would be to have a search and replace function uh, like you have in Microsoft Word. But to do this in the genome of a cell, uh, it becomes a lot more challenging. And so the solution that we have been working on over a little more than a decade now um, has been to harness microbial um, immune systems uh, to be able to um, uh, recognize specific DNA sequences in the, gene, in the genome and then be able to correct it. And so one of these immune systems uh, came from, um, maybe some of you have had for breakfast this morning, uh, from, from the inside of, of uh, bacteria that are used to make yogurt. And these bacteria have evolved, uh, like many other bacteria, a system called CRISPR to be able to fight off uh, uh, infectious agents. And so here's a picture of what the, um, uh, of what the, uh, the enzymes uh, look like from these CRISPR systems. The blue blob is a protein, uh, the CRISPR protein, and you can program it uh, with an RNA uh, guide, uh, like a search string, uh, and put it into the genome of a cell. So now this protein will search along the, the DNA, which is here in blue, and when the RNA in red matches with the DNA in blue, uh, then the enzyme gets activated and it will go and make a double-stranded cut in the, D in the DNA. That cut allows the cell to target the modification. And so one way uh, the cell repairs the cut is it just uh, removes a little bit of the ends and then put it back together. And this is very useful if scientists want to get rid of something that is deleterious. But even more powerful is that once you have a cut, you have the two open ends. And you can now provide into the cell a piece of synthetic, chemically made a piece of DNA that carry the correct information. And this DNA can, can anneal or, or basically link to the two broken ends of DNA. And when that happens, uh, the DNA will get uh, incorporated and then, uh, and then you have a precise uh, replacement of the uh, disease causing sequence. And so, um, this technique is, is now being widely explored uh, for uh, the treatment of diseases. And one example uh, that we had done in the laboratory was to see whether or not we can use this to treat uh, a mouse model of, uh, of a cardiovascular disease. 
So um, companies uh, like Genzyme have been um, uh, developing um, uh, sort of proteins that can bind to a molecule called PCSK9 uh, and, and inactivate it. And this is a, a, a powerful way to be able to uh, reduce cholesterol uh, in the human body. And so instead of using these proteins to get rid of uh, PCSK9, uh, we use uh, the gene editing CRISPR uh, system to then go and find the PCSK9 gene and then introduce a change in the genome that can inactivate it. So basically do the same thing that proteins are able to do, but um, uh, doing it in a way that you only have to change it once and then you can have a long lasting uh, effect in the body. The way we did this is, is to package all the CRISPR machineries into a virus shown here on the left. And then we can inject uh, this virus uh, into um, the, the, the veins of, of, of a mouse. And then the virus will go into the liver, recognize the gene and then be able to modify this PCSK9 gene so that it is no longer made in the body. And by doing this, we were able to see a very dramatic effect. So on, on, on this um, chart here, um, this is um, the, the PCSK9 protein level uh, that's measured in the blood of these mice. And the gray uh, or, black, uh, or white line here is, is the control. So there's no changes in these animals. If you inject in the virus carrying the CRISPR uh, components on day zero, what you find is that uh, about seven days after the, the injection, the PCSK9 level becomes um, sort of undetectable within the blood. And so this is, this is exactly what we wanted to achieve um, because by, by removing PCSK9, uh, we can now reduce uh, cholesterol in the body. So that is just one example of, of many of the applications that scientists are now pursuing uh, to be able to treat disease. Uh, at, toward the end of last year, uh, there was really exciting result uh, announced uh, in a human trial where the CRISPR system was used to treat uh, beta thalassemia, a blood disorder. And, uh, and in, the, in, the pre, uh, in the first uh, patient that they uh, tried this on, uh, it seemed to have a, a significant effect, which is uh, very exciting and, and promising for a lot of patients. Besides uh, the area of human health, uh, the CRISPR-Cas or gene editing system also has applications in agriculture, uh, ways to be able to make um, uh, crops more uh, drought resistant, uh, more nutritious, and also uh, take up less natural resources, uh, clean water, so that um, they can be um, more environmentally uh, friendly. And so um, here are just two examples of, um, uh, of produces that have been uh, engineered uh, on the left side are uh, mushrooms that no longer brown. Uh, they, they don't become sort of very, um, uh, they, they don't turn brown and, and look very sort of uh, um, unappetizing. And then on the right are soybeans that have been edited so that they have, uh, they produce more uh, oleic acid, which are, which are a, a healthy uh, type of um, um, composition for, for these uh, soybeans. And there are many other ways that scientists are now uh, using this in, in uh, in row crops, uh, in corn, uh, in, uh, in, in rice, uh, and also uh, in different types of vegetables uh, and also fruits as well. And, and of course, um, a technology that's really powerful also has a lot of potential uh, impacts uh, on society. And so one of the uh, major things that have been um, sort of undergoing public debate is how far do we wanna go with gene editing? Uh, do, do we want to allow society and, and individuals to use it to modify the human germline. And this is uh, a very contentious uh, topic and, and uh, is, is being uh, very actively debated. And, um, and so, so that's kind of an overview around the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. There are a lot of powerful um, potentials for using this to improve human lives, but also there are a lot of ethical challenges that, that give people pause as they uh, move forward. So I want to switch gear a little bit um, because there's another interesting molecule that we um, have been able to find from the natural diversity uh, that is very useful uh, for diagnostics and especially, and that's especially relevant uh, for, for the ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19. And so the story um, too is um, some of the bacteria that are found in the gum of humans um, have the ability to be turned into a, a, de a detection system for, for virus uh, and bacterial uh, genetic signatures. So over here, this is a picture showing a lot of different bacteria in the natural world. They have different shapes and, and sometimes they string them, uh, themselves together. And Cas9, um, what I told you about gene editing, came from one type of bacteria. 
But if you look at another type of bacteria, uh, there's another molecule called Cas13. And, and this is a molecule that is um, what we're able to harness uh, for, for turning into a diagnostic device. And so using this uh, methodology, we developed a technique called Sherlock, where you can program these Cas13 proteins uh, with a RNA guide molecule so that the guide matches the virus, uh, for example, uh, COVID-19 virus signature. And, uh, and by uh, using this protein, we can develop a way to uh, very easily read out, for example, using a paper strip to see whether or not a virus is present. And so when you run a paper strip like this, you see whether or not a line shows up. If the line is present, then you know that the virus is, is present. And this technique, uh, Sherlock, um, has, has recently uh, received approval from the US FDA uh, for, for emergency use authorization. And so, so that is one one approach that, that, that is uh, now ongoing. And some of the work that I've been doing uh, with, uh, in my lab is to continue to develop these technologies and also to develop a simple uh, device, uh, uh, devices that are low cost and easy to um, mass produce so that we can really get these tests out uh, into, into the world and, and uh, try to make a difference for, for the pandemic. So just to go back to the, to the picture of nature, uh, there really are, um, uh, we're only really uh, scraping the, the surface of, of the natural diversity. And by, by really looking deep into all of the different uh, organisms in, in the uh, ecological system, I think there are going to be many powerful biotechnologies that can make uh, very important uh, contributions to making uh, our lives better and also to make our lives uh, more sustainable uh, on this planet. So last but not least, I just want to acknowledge my team. Uh, these are the graduate students and postdoctoral fellows uh, who are uh, working with us. We, we took this picture right, right next to the McGovern Institute uh, uh, last year. Um, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be a part of this uh, presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, lovely to, uh, to be invited uh, for this uh, Solving Anywhere special event. Uh, I'm Alex Samuel, I'm the Executive Director of SOLVE, and I get to spend uh, some time with all of you, as well as uh, Dennis, Heather, and Professor Zhang uh, for the next few minutes talking about um, their work and how that relates to SOLVE and to the MIT communities. Uh, please feel free to start typing in as we go along. Uh, please feel free to start typing any questions you have uh, for the panelists. And then um, I will open the last 10 minutes uh, or so for, um, for, I will get to ask your questions to the panelists as we go. Um, so uh, so uh, as mentioned, SOLVE is an initiative of MIT and its mission is to solve world challenges, which is very much aligned to MIT's overall mission to serve the nation and the world in the 25th century as well as the campaign for the better world. And I think you had some, this great talk by um, Professor Zhang on sort of how his work in the research lab translates into real world potential applications to solve world challenges. Um, Dennis and Heather, who are MIT alumni, are in the real world, if you will, and are using a number of the work that they did, I, MIT at many different institutions, um, to sort of really move move that forward. And so Solve for me is a marketplace for innovation, connecting innovators all around the world with researchers at MIT, with funders, with MIT alumni, with a number of people to, to really build um, solutions and to accelerate solutions that uh, are using technology to change the world for good. Uh, but so without further ado, I wanted to uh, start off with our two solver teams, uh, Dennis and Heather. Um, and let's start, let's start, uh, ladies first, let's start with Heather, if that's okay. Um, so in a, we'd love to just hear from you how, um, what is your solution, uh, the uh, Practical Education Network? And um, how, how has uh, SOLVE and MIT helped you uh, in that journey? Yeah, thank you, Alex. And it's great to be here virtually with um, so, many, uh, so much of the MIT community. 
So my name is Heather Beam. I completed my PhD in course two about five years ago now. And I started an, an education organization as a side project while I was a grad student at MIT. And shortly after I graduated, I, I decided to pursue it full time and move to West Africa, to Ghana, where I, where I have lived for the last few years. So the mission that we are on at Practical Education Network is to enable every African child to learn by doing. So just as I got to experience at MIT and all of you on this call as well, we were fortunate to get to go to a place that although it was challenging a lot of times, you know, really at the core, we got exposed to so many practical project-based types of experiences. And that's something that is really far from the reality that a lot of students around the world experience in their normal schooling. And so Practical Education Network is working to make that learning by doing experience a reality for more students. Um, so what we do is we do training for STEM teachers um, at, across the K-12 spectrum, and we help them um, leverage low cost, locally available resources to bring their teaching to life. And I have a, a little um, demo here. Let me see if it'll show up on the, on the screen or not. So um, this may be familiar to some of you, but um, respiration uh, in the human body is something that you can teach, obviously, by drawing on the blackboard, which is basically what everybody <laughs> relies on here. Or you can create a model with really simple, locally available things. In this case, a water bottle with the bottom cut off, a balloon hanging inside, and then a a plastic bag on the bottom. And then as you pull the plastic bag out, the balloon inflates. And as you push it in, it deflates. So inflation and deflation as the bag is moving in and out. And so this really clearly and simply shows the concept of how the diaphragm interacts in your respiratory system. And as soon as a student does this, they're going to remember it so um, for such a long time compared to if they were just you know, copying notes on the blackboard. And so we're on this mission to um, help all teachers across Ghana, across West Africa, to be able to incorporate these types of resources into their normal teaching. And we were fortunate about two years ago to be selected into Solve's class for teachers and educators. And it's been an amazing experience. Solve has an incredible community of the diverse range of stakeholders Alex just described. And it's been great to be able to enter into that and get their support um, even now, a couple of years later after having been in the official um, cohort. So that's my intro, thanks. Wonderful. Uh, so Dennis, tell us about uh, Maroda, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Maroda Robotics um, uh, and what, what your what you're seeking to solve with Maroda, but also um, how how Solve and the MIT community in general have helped you um, throughout this journey. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me on here. Uh, my name is Dennis Shiansky. I'm a class of 1997, um, in course 10 and 5. And then I went on to get my master's and PhD from Stanford in chemical engineering as well. Uh, my co-founder, who we've been um, friends since middle school, so 20, 25 years, um, he's a roboticist, and he does uh, biomimicry. Uh, what Marauder does is we're building this underwater, uh, autonomous underwater vehicle platform that leverages computer vision, machine learning, and robotics in order to automate what divers do manually. So it's an automation play. Um, and we're applying this technology and this platform to uh, ocean restoration, specifically ocean barren uh, restoration. Um, we are focusing our first initial efforts off the coast of Southern California, off of Palo Verde, Palo Verde Peninsula. We're currently doing um, underwater mapping where we're going to put our systems um, into place. FOB has allowed me to continue to use and uh, network with my MIT peers. Um, it's allowed multiple perspectives uh, and allowed us to focus on 
not only restoration, but how to have an impact on this world using the engineering abilities that we've been given by the institutions that we've attended and the peers and mentors that we've come in contact with. That's what SAWS has done for us, as well as MIT and Stanford. Wonderful. Um, and uh, uh, if you see, you're starting to see, I think, the diversity of the solar teams that we have. Uh, Heather has been in teach was uh, successful in the teachers and educators challenge. Dennis was successful in the coastal communities challenge. And then Jess, if you could uh, pull up that slide on the 2020 challenges briefly, as I uh, switch to a question for Professor Zhang, um, you'll see that these are the challenges which just closed in July. Um, usually there are four, but um, exceptionally we launched a fifth challenge focused on health security and pandemics um, at the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 crisis to, to reflect the moment. Um, and we uh, received 2,600 applications from 135 countries. That's roughly double uh, than last year. Um, and uh, the most number of solutions we got uh, was in the Health Security and Pandemics Challenge, as well as the Good Jobs and Inclusive Entrepreneurship Challenge, which I think makes um, sense in, in that way. Uh, and Professor Jang, you're, um, you're uh, on the leadership group um, for the Health Security and Pandemics Challenge, which means uh, you're going to, you are in fact uh, selecting uh, you're in the middle of it, um, but you're going to be helping to select um, who the next class of solver teams is. Um, so I think very briefly, um, what have you, without revealing, you know, you can't reveal any names or any people you're, <laughs> you're judging at the moment and you're very excited about because we haven't made the selection, but um, what are you seeing, you know, having seen the diversity of solutions, what are you seeing come up on this and what are your thoughts on on overall the process in terms of, of this sort of open innovation uh, concept? Yeah, I, I, I think um, there, there's a lot of very exciting ideas that have been proposed and, um, and a lot of uh, really passionate and motivated uh, individuals. I think we're seeing um, uh, really a lot of um, sort of different approaches where there's quite a bit of um, ways that these different groups will be able to interact with each other to um, uh, to sort of help each other achieve achieve the common goal. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of um, sort of collaboration that, that will happen uh, as a result of this. Um, specifically, the pandemic area has been something that is uh, very, um, very much on the on the uh, on the top of the priority list, um, especially given what we're faced with uh, right now. Uh, so there are a lot of great ideas that are focused on producing low cost, rapid, um, sort of easily scalable solutions so that um, uh, so that it, it will be possible to very rapidly spin up um, solutions to be able to uh, monitor, track, and also to, and to contain uh, the spread of pandemics. Uh, so I think, I think overall it's very, very exciting and uh, um, it's also great to be uh, sort of all, all, all part of the MIT community um, pushing to make, make a positive impact. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, and especially because we know you're, you're very busy. So thank you for, for taking the time on that. And uh, I think you're absolutely right. What's, um, when we select the class of solver teams, we don't select one winner for a challenge. We don't believe that there's one silver bullet solution that's gonna solve these big challenges. We select a class of, it depends, but six to 10 is usually what we do, and that's really this portfolio approach to innovation and thinking that you need, in fact, a diversity of solutions across technology, geography, the people who are bringing these solutions forward. And indeed that you see collaborations solver to solver because they have complementary solutions, but also obviously solver to member, solver to MIT researcher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so talking a little bit about one of these partnerships, um, Heather. Um, one of uh, one of our members, uh, Mike Christian from uh, an organization called Somebody Else's Child Foundation, um, and um, is working with you on a new partnership uh, recently. 
So can you tell us a little bit about, um, about what that, what his support is going to allow you to do in terms of expanding your, your work? Yeah, we're so grateful that Solve connected us to this foundation, who, which is based in Boston and has been supporting various things related to children and youth in a lot, especially in the Boston area for quite some years. And we're excited to get to be their first partner to work in West Africa and hopefully build on some of the learnings that they've had working with children and youth um, for the years. So what we're doing with them is um, in line with what we are now push to do because of COVID. So as you can imagine, our, our work has all been in person given the hands-on nature of what we're, what we're promoting. Everything we've really just focused 100% on in-person interactions. And now with COVID, it's become so clear that we have to move into the digital world. So um, this partnership is going to enable us to translate our training, teacher training content um, to digital modules and then expand that to a hundred teachers across um, four different districts. So we're really excited for this opportunity um, Which will not just enable us to reach those hundred teachers, but we envision can help us to reach um, Teachers much more broadly as well through the digital platforms Wonderful um, moving to you Dennis um... I guess, um, how has COVID-19 affected your work? And maybe the answer, it hasn't, or maybe it's made it harder because uh, the sustainability um, questions are being put to the side. But I'm interested, sort of, what is the, the impact of COVID-19 on, on your work and how are you dealing with that in, if it's, if it's uh, uh, difficult? Um, so the question is, uh, has COVID-19 impacted our work. Um, actually, it hasn't. Um, we've been working with teams as far away as, as Australia, where this is a major problem. It impacts 2,000 uh, miles of coastline along Tasmania and southern Australia. Uh, they were engaged two years ago. We've always engaged them via Zoom. Uh, we were doing video conferencing before COVID-19. So it hasn't impacted us. It hasn't impacted us overseas. It hasn't impacted us uh, in California. Uh, the strange thing about what we're doing is we're doing an ocean technology development company in a landlocked city. We're located in Atlanta. Uh, we're not on the ocean. We have to go to our clients. Most of our clients are two or more uh, zones, uh, time zones away. So we've always manage this. And so it was, it was really easy. It was seamless when COVID happened. We were, we we're doing the same thing that we we're always doing. Uh, the thing that changed was when the uh, Smith uh, Family Foundation backed us in November of last year and funded us early in Q1 of this year. Um, it allowed us to um, shape the market. They shaped the market and they funded our first pilot in Southern California. Uh, which we're doing right now. So we've been uh, accelerating what we've been doing since COVID started. And we're doing the mapping right now. We're doing our first deployment later this year with the tech that we're building on the bench. And we talk to our teams on both coasts uh, pretty much every week. So it hasn't been a problem for our team. Wonderful. Good to hear, um, and that we're not forgetting oceans and sustainability in these yeah. in this crisis. Um, Professor Jang, I wanted to ask you, sort of building a bit on what Dennis was saying. You know, a lot of your work obviously is um, is very much in the lab, but has very clear applications for the real world. Some of which you were showing us the both the agriculture um, disease, um, but also agriculture. Um, what? How does um, how has MIT, but also the broader innovation ecosystem around Kendall Square, how does that help translate um, from the lab and the research you're doing to actually um, to actually these these applications in the real world, and especially I would say to to the most uh, unmet needs. Um, and and you know, is there a challenge there, or is that working? You know, is that working well? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So the MIT ecosystem um, is, is um, 
I think very, very exciting and very instrumental for the translation of uh, new laboratory uh, technologies, especially in the life sciences. Uh, Kindle Square um, is, has become um, one of the epicenters for biotechnology and life science uh, around, uh, you know, all over, the, uh, you know, compared to all the other places around the world, it's really one of the, the most exciting places. And, um, and that's because within the ecosystem, there are uh, entrepreneurs, there are um, so capitalists who can provide uh, the financing to uh, rapidly uh, spin out uh, new cutting edge ideas from, from laboratories. And, uh, and so for both of the stories that I mentioned to you about, um, I've uh, had the opportunity to work with entrepreneurs uh, to spin out uh, new companies. Uh, for gene editing, uh, we uh, set up a new company, uh, actually not so new anymore, back in 2014 um, uh, called Edit House Medicine. Uh, and uh, Editas has now begun uh, human trial testing to use the gene editing medicine to treat blindness. And then for the second story, um, diagnostics, um, two years ago, we set up a company called Sherlock Biosciences. And Sherlock has been uh, in the process of setting up uh, different types of diagnostics applications. And when COVID-19 uh, 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 sort of came up, um, they uh, repurposed a lot of their efforts to develop a diagnostic for COVID-19. And then um, a couple of months ago, uh, they were able to get um, a CRISPR-based diagnostic using cas approved uh, by the FDA so that uh, people can use it to expand testing capacity uh, around, around the country. Uh, and, and so all these, I think, are, are really owing to the ecosystem that is around MIT, uh, both um, MIT itself, but also alumni who graduate from MIT that working together to, to make it possible to uh, translate these ideas out into real products that can benefit people. Wonderful. Um, and uh, I'm going to start opening up to the audience Q&A. Uh, so keep sending in your questions. Um, I might come back to my own questions if we run out, but uh, so far I'm being sent lots of great questions. So this is a question uh, from Bruce. Uh, uh, sorry, Ruth Donat, and he's asking Heather, uh, how did you pick West Africa and why did you pick West Africa? And how about East St. Louis? And I wonder if Bruce is from East St. Louis. Yeah, I'm guessing that might be the case. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality I think that Bruce is getting at is that the need for hands-on STEM education is, is really all over the place. It's, there's no way to deny that. Um, for me, I was, I was curious about Africa as someone who had, you know, been fortunate to travel to many places growing up. Africa was this question in my mind. What is it really like? You know, there are narratives that we see in the media and all that, but I wanted to experience it myself. So I was drawn to Africa and through MIT's D-Lab program, which some of you may be familiar with, that does a lot of international development work. Um, they have a strong network of connections in Ghana. They've been sending students here for quite some time. So it ended up being um, a natural place for me to, to come and try, try things out. And it's, it's been a great fit. Wonderful. Uh, so for Professor Zhang, um, and I'm not sure who's, uh, who's asking that question, so apologies. Uh, but uh, how has the food industry, or how have the food industry and then consumers responding to the use of CRISPR for genetic modification of foods. Uh, mm. Is it a good thing, a bad thing? Are they even realizing that this might be coming up? That's a really, uh, that's a really great question. Um, CRISPR, of course, is still in the very early stages of being applied in, um, in agriculture. Um, and um, there is there's something that, that is uh, very different about using CRISPR to modify uh, plants that is um, that is not the same as uh, genetic modified organisms. Uh, GMO organisms uh, typically uh, involve the introduction of a transgene. So this would be a piece of genetic information that has never existed in that plant before. And then, um, and then the, in, uh, the scientists are, are putting it into uh, a plant to uh, confer a new type of activity, maybe resistant to a certain type of a pesticide or, or, or have some kind of insect resistance uh, uh, function. Using CRISPR to edit uh, is very different. Um, CRISPR is more like accelerated breeding uh, and, uh, and ways to be able to more rapidly uh, generate more variations in the plants to find new traits. 
um, usually the, the way CRISPR is being applied is um, you may sequence um, a plant species uh, and figure out what are the genetic uh, features that make um, uh, a, a desirable trait. Uh, so for example, if you have a apple that is uh, you know, big and juicy, but not so sweet, and then you have a tiny apple that is very sweet, but not big and juicy, uh, you may figure out what are the um, genetic signatures for each one of those properties. And then using CRISPR, uh, you have the ability to combine them together. Um, this is what people would do normally for agriculture. They will cross uh, these different species to get to the combined trait. Uh, but with CRISPR, you can do it much faster because you don't have to go through years of crossing and breeding to select out uh, the feature. Um, these are, of course, very nuanced uh, differences. And I think it will, it will, it will take some time to, um, to sort of inform and also to, um, to really get the, get the details out uh, so that people have a full understanding of what, what the differences are. Wonderful. And while I'm at it, uh, so that was a question from Jeffrey. Thank you, Jeffrey. And then uh, while I'm at it for, for yourself, uh, another one, Professor Zhang, from yeah. Rod this time, um, yeah. which, is, uh, which I like a lot. So Rod understands the concept for how to change a cell uh, from your presentation, mm -hmm. but how do you change all of the relevant cells in the body at the same time? Yeah, this is actually one of the, the most difficult challenges uh, that are faced by, by gene editing. Uh, right now, what people do is uh, they treat uh, using two methods. Uh, the first is called ex vivo treatment. So what that means is you take cells out of the body, and this works for the blood system because you can take blood cells out, modify them, uh, you know, mo modify uh, almost all of them in a petri dish, and then put it back into the body. Um, the second approach is more challenging. It's called in vivo uh, uh, editing. And that requires going into the body. And this is where uh, you're exactly right that uh, there are way more cells than we can potentially um, uh, get hold of and, and modify. So scientists are, are working on, including many MIT scientists, are working on ways to deliver uh, this uh, gene editing machinery into uh, many, many cells efficiently. Uh, the most um, advanced method right now is using uh, viral vectors. These are viruses that naturally have the ability to infect human cells and, and deliver into human cells. So what scientists do is they take um, these viruses and they remove everything that is pathogenic um, about those viruses and replace that information with the gene editing information. And, uh, and so um, a, a, um, a, a treatment uh, would work uh, where a scientist would produce um, billions or, or hundreds or thousands of billions um, uh, of, of uh, viruses and they inject it into a patient. And then these viruses would circulate throughout the body and then uh, find the, the tissue, uh, for example, the liver or the muscle in the body and then enter those cells and, and carry out the modification. Uh, but, but that is uh, an active area of research that will, will require a lot more innovation. Yeah. And those are very promising if one can identify, for example, cancer cells as opposed to healthy cells um, as, as one potential application. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so for Dennis, um, a question which I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the person who's asking it, but what's the cost uh, of your solution relative to existing approaches or vehicles? I guess uh, I'll add the sort of broader, broader piece of like, how does the how do you get paid and, and how, how, how does the, um, where, where, where does the business uh, plan make sense? Um, early on, uh, so we're working in shallow water coastal environments uh, that you can be really productive. Um, every other breath that people take usually comes from plants in the ocean environment. Uh, cheap protein for growing population comes usually from the ocean. It just comes from seafood. Um, how we get paid initially is by doing the restoration. We're, we're providing a uh, inter inter internet of things uh, type of technology that will allow marine managers to manage ocean environments from their deck. We're putting hardware that will be able to actually do things in the ocean. Um, they'll be able to interact with it over cell cellular networks um, and make decisions, real-time decisions, because you're getting real-time data from those environments. Uh, and with 
real-time decisions, uh, you're able to improve the health of those environments and the productivity of those environments. So that's the first one. And then the next one is uh, the data. The data, being able to make decisions around policy, industry, instead of searching the ocean for uh, your harvest. Uh, we can tell you with GPS accuracy where to go, how much to harvest, when to stop harvesting, uh, so that you have sustainable yield and the, and the area is able to recuperate or rejuvenate. Um, we're able to do all of that because we have hardware in the ocean at the site where things are happening. And we're including the bio uh, productivity of those areas. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and I think we have uh, five minutes uh, less um, and I'm going to ask uh, one question for Heather and if we have time, a conclusion question for Professor Jiang. I hope we have time. So Heather, there's a series of questions and comments about the shift to remote. You know, first of all, um, you said you're, you're shifting a lot of this in-person practical training now. You're doing a lot more virtual and digital given given the crisis, um, but uh, is that good? Are you is that going to reduce the quality of the STEM education, or is there great virtual tools? And could you, how can you, you know, what's the link between digitization and virtualization and quality? Well, I can't answer that question concretely yet without having gotten far enough along to be, you know, completely honest. But I think that it's. It's a necessity. The the you know the situation on the ground with the pandemic is is pretty bad. There's you know most students here have not had any you know ongoing learning for the last six months. Only the very top few percent that go to the elite schools have had any sort of you know structured learning. And so the need is pretty serious. And even when schools eventually reopen, the reality is that. There, there's a huge need for more practical education um, across this country and across a lot of the region. And so if it means that, if, if going virtual means that we can reach more people, but you know, they don't get the, you know, they get 90% of the experience or something like that, I think it's still, it's still a good direction to go. So these are some of the trade-offs I think we have to make given the, the situation we're in. Wonderful. Uh, oh, and so to conclude, uh, for Professor Jiang, and this is a question, uh, I'm going to mispronounce the name, I apologize. Uh, Shai Amada Spananji, thank you for asking this question. Uh, so MIT and its surroundings, Kendall Square, has emerged as this sort of wonderful innovation ecosystem. What do you think are the key factors contributing to this? But then what is required to really duplicate this in other locales, whether that was in fact Ghana or uh, a number of other places? How do, how do you create other innovation ecosystems around the world? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, it's a tough question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I think uh, from my perspective. I think MIT um, and the Cambridge, uh, Kindle Square area uh, is very successful because First and foremost, it's got MIT, which is a very, um, very uh, prestigious, very well, has a long history of producing innovation and has um, a lot of uh, really sort of uh, motivated, but also practical people uh, who are a part of the, the MIT uh, system. And then um, at the same time, I think uh, what is important is um, kind of the the environment around here uh, where uh, it's not just MIT, but also industry um, and, and the school and also the industry being willing to work with each other to foster um, sort of collaborations. And I think all that together is, is what um, really uh, caused this big boom uh, in the Kindle Square area. Um, uh, with Novartis moving into uh, Kindle Square or Kim Cambridge, uh, and then with, with a lot of the other uh, big and, and also small startups that are starting in this general area. Uh, that density, uh, I think, reached a certain tipping point that, that is now just uh, sort of uh, forging on its own. Uh, to, to create a new e ecosystem, I think, starting from a, from a top tier um, sort of academic institution as, as the hub um, is, is um, I think, is a, a great way to do it. 
And you see this out in the West Coast too, uh, right next to Stanford, you have Silicon Valley. And, and that also um, began with, with uh, a top tier academic environment as, as the seed. Uh, and then what is important is that academic environment has to be practically minded. So having an engineering tendency and thinking about how to develop solutions rather than only building ivory tower uh, academic science uh, is also very important. Uh, and, and not having the perspective that industry is evil or uh, you know, anything outside of academia is, is not pure, uh, that is also very important uh, to, to make this all succeed. Um, wonderful, thank you. Um, and in a sense, I would say that Solve is trying to be um, an open innovation ecosystem around the world, and it is obviously much more virtual and diffuse. And the equivalent thinking would be, you know, the MIT on-campus learning experience versus open learning and edX and all the sort of courses. And, and it's not quite the same, but it's trying to, it's trying to allow a lot more people to reach um, a lot more innovators to be part of a virtualized innovation ecosystem. So that's sort of a good uh, segue back into to sort of what Sol does uh, overall. Um, so we're going to be switching now to uh, the workshop per portion of our, our, of our event that will be uh, led by one of my staff members, Pooja. Pooja is an MIT alumni from electrical engineering. She'll lead you through an interactive workshop. You'll have to log in. We'll explain it. You'll have to log in and through a different link to get the workshop part of it because we're moving from webinar to the sort of an interactive Zoom. Uh, but other ways to stay engaged with us, um, uh, if you're interested, uh, you can become a mentor and work with different solar teams such as Heather and Dennis and also all, a number of people all around the world. Uh, you can be a reviewer to help uh, select solutions for the next set of challenges. Uh, you can host workshops uh, if you have a network that you're interested in bringing in um, and us working with you on this. Uh, and you can join uh, Solve as a member uh, and uh, members uh, get access to all our events and get uh, to work with the Solver teams and uh, and a number of other pieces. So we're happy to talk, uh, my team, um, Pooja and a number of people will be happy uh, to, to, be, uh, to talk to you about any of these options. Uh, and we'll be sharing all of this in a follow-up email um, as, uh, as you wish. Um, so I wanna thank Professor Jang, Heather, Dennis for this panel. I want to encourage everybody to stay for the workshop and get your hands dirty um, with our team to, uh, to help. Um, and I'll pass it on uh, to the team uh, to make sure that you get in the right links. Thank you. So yes, it's in your confirmation Hi. email, but. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us and uh... The, uh, the link to the next program is in the, sec it's the second link. So thank you so much. We'll see you on the other side. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.